Welcome to the short video on gate biomechanics simplified. My name is Binoy Matthew, a specialist physiotherapy. So in this short video, I'll be looking at uh, some selected aspect of the biomechanics of walking and running gait, which is a complex topic. Although no two individuals share the same anatomy strength or proprioception, there's certainly uh, some key similarities uh, in the gait cycle. And there'll be a special emphasis on the kinematics of the foot and ankle in the gait cycles and also the clinical relevance um, especially linking with certain pathologies now looking at the gait cycle so we're looking at both the walking um, gait as well as the running gait gait cycle starts from one foot makes contact with the ground and ends when the same foot makes contact with the ground again it can be divided into two distinct phases the stance phase um, as you can see uh, where uh, the foot is in contact with the ground and the swing phase during which the foot is not in contact with the ground generally the swing phase uh, is passive now looking into the different uh, sub phases so you've got the initial contact mid stance take off and the initial swing, mid swing, and the terminal swing, and also you got the breaking stage, where which is linked with the absorption of energy. It's important to understand that the key differences between running and walking gait. So, the first uh, key difference is uh, running has an, a key phase called the float phase or the flight phase, which occurs twice during the running gait. The float phase is where both the legs are not in contact with the ground, which doesn't happen in walking. In walking, you have the period of double support, where both the feet is um, on the ground, which doesn't happen in running. Therefore, running can be defined as either one leg or no leg striking the ground. Generally, when you walking, the stand phase is around 60% of the gait and the swing phase is 40%. Whereas in running, as the velocity increases, the stance phase becomes less and less. Another key differences are uh, the step width. So generally when you're walking, you have a wider step width. When you start running, it becomes narrowed. The anterior pelvic tilt is also um, increased. When you're walking, the momentum comes from the stance leg, whereas when you're running, the momentum comes from the swinging arms. when you have injury or your body weight fluctuates or footwear all all these factors can influence your running style now what are the physical demands on the implications on running the impact forces can be huge we're talking around 2.5 to 3 times body weight especially on the foot and ankle the muscles have to work harder they're uh, more eccentric contraction uh, and the range of motion also increases especially in joints like the hip and the ankle the body has to do two key jobs one is both shock absorption and also use the energy and muscle contraction in propulsion so as you can see the demands on the body is higher and therefore the injury rate is also higher there are some key terminology which is associated with um, running gait uh, first is the kinematics, the motions that we can see and assess. As you can see in the picture, looking at the different range of motion in the ankle, knee and the hip during various phases of the gait cycle. And the second aspect is the kinetics. It's the forces which drive the motion. Um, it can be measured using for force plates and also looking at the muscle, act uh, muscle activation, looking at EMG function how muscles control the kinematics and the kinetics. Uh, there are few specific terms which are used in running. The number one is the cadence or the step rate. So normally when you're walking, you, you walk around 100 to 120 steps per minute. When you run, it increases, which can go from anywhere from 170 plus. Generally, a cadence of 180 and plus is considered to be favorable. 
the next key uh, terminology is the step length so as you can see the step length is a difference between initial contact of one foot and the opposite foot that's the step length is the sp um, and also the stride length which is the um, distance between the initial contact of the same foot to uh, of the same foot in the next cycle so these are the key terms now moving on to the muscle contribution what is the role of the muscles during running the knee and the ankle flex and the foot rolls in to absorb the impact forces the quads is the largest contributor to braking and support during the stance phase so if you're running downhill the eccentric load of uh, the quads is higher and this has been linked with the conditions like patellar tendinopathy once the um, leg is directly on the hips then the action of the glute max glute mean and the rectus is increased tibialis posterior is a key muscle which controls pronation most of the power from propulsion comes from the gastroc and the soleus the hip extensions are quite interesting whereas the input varies with the speed uh, the faster you are there is more contribution from the hip extensions muscle activity can change within the same individual depending on the speed and also the running style so if you change your shoes or you change your style of running uh, it's highly likely that your muscle uh, activation patterns could also be different now moving on specifically into the kinematics of the foot and ankle so most runners will land on the lateral aspect of the foot in a supinated uh, position and after a heel str uh, strike they're going to pronation which should aid in the um, shock absorption so it can be anywhere from 6 to 8 degrees which is a natural uh, range and then a toe off they go into a locked foot so this is a, a normal variation the dorsiflexion um, is um, key here so as you can look you see you need at least 15 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion in the mid, mid stance position now pronation the study by Morley had looked into classifying uh, pronation based on calcaneal aversion so he had graded into a low pronation mid pronation and high pronation um, we have to remember that pronation is a three-dimensional movement so you're having calcaneal aversion the medial um, drop in the medial arch as well as forefoot abduction what's the relevance of um, calcaneal aversion it's been linked with certain pathologies so if it's very high uh, it could lead to excessive strain on the medial posterior aspect of the tibia and it's been shown to be a predictor of tibial stress fractures in runners so uh, it's a key factor to look especially if you're suspecting stress fractures or conditions like medial tibial stress syndrome now moving on dorsiflexion which is a key component and how does dorsiflexion reduce dorsiflexion affect lower limb kinematics the study by uh, Whitting and all had shown that uh, that limited anti dorsiflexion could lead to increased pronation uh, so there's a direct link there there is also a link between dorsiflexion range of motion and dynamic balance Hosh in 2012 had shown that patients uh, clients with limited dorsiflexion had also reduced scores on the star exertion balance test which is an um, indicator for injury risk and also um, Bell had shown that um, uh, decreased dorsiflexion could lead to dynamic knee valgus in certain individuals finally uh, the importance of uh, picking up dorsiflexion in forward lean so uh, this is which I see quite commonly with the overhead squat so one of the key reasons for excessive forward trunk lean could be because of uh, reduced dorsiflexion now dorsiflexion can also have a big impact on landing when you're jumping and landing it increases ground reaction forces it can uh, reduce your knee flexion range on landing and put you possibly in a knee valgus all of this could lead to increased risk of injury is there any link with dorsiflexion pathologies uh, there are few studies which I looked at so Williams study in 2005 had shown that that's a uh, that clients with limited dorsiflexion there's an increased risk of ankle sprains 
and it's also linked with conditions like plantar fasciitis where um, Bolivar had shown that a specificity of 96 percentage that reduced ankle dorsiflexion is linked with plantar fasciitis. Now reduced ankle dorsiflexion is nothing new uh, as early as uh, 1985 Hughes had shown that uh, patients with limited dorsiflexion were four times more likely to develop uh, metatarsal stress fractures. Internal femoral rotation and decrease in afflection are all are known risk factors of patellar femoral pain syndrome. So a reduced dorsiflexion could also be a key factor which could uh, lead into this multi-complex uh, etiology of patellar femoral pain syndrome. Pete Malielis uh, had looked at nearly 113 male and female volleyball players looking at the key risk factors and limited dorsiflexion was one of the key factors which was been linked with uh, incidence of patellar tendinopathy in volleyball players. Define differential diagnosis of the leg, foot and ankle difficult. If you're interested on evidence-based management of overuse of uh, leg, foot and ankle injuries, as well as if you are interested in learning new manual techniques, head over to www.physiouk.co.uk slash leg to give you further information on our one day workshop hope you found the presentation useful thank you for your time